Well, if you've never read through a chapter, a whole chapter in the book of Revelation, you're going to have that opportunity right now. So the ushers are handing out Bibles. Raise your hand if you don't have a Bible on your hand. And then turn it to Revelation chapter 5, where our message title this morning is Worthy is the Lamb. And uh, we're going to see that in Scripture. We're going to see how they're praising the Lord throughout the universe. Um, Calvary Chapel, we teach book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We say this is the place where the sheep love to eat. You're not getting a whole lot of commentary. You're getting a lot of word. And uh, we love to eat of the word of God. It is the best thing for us. Now, we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend. And if a soldier gave your life, if you were the one that had to charge the hill and something's coming at your side and he comes, a soldier or she comes and takes that bullet for you, you become appreciative. And if you're able to accompany the body home to the States uh, and you're there with the family as you're laying that one to rest, you have nothing but words of appreciation. And you esteem that family, you esteem that soldier that gave their life for you. Jesus, in the same way, and even greater, greater than just for America, Jesus gave his life for the world. And we don't see him hurt. We remember him being, uh, through the Bible, we remember he was crucified. He was beaten. He died on our behalf. But today, John, who was with him, Jesus who commended his mom to John and John to take care of his mom, John sees the lamb in heaven. And when that happens, it's original praise. It's, it's worship that comes out from his heart. Not only from him, from being there, but watch what happens around us. Let me say this to you. You begin to praise the Lord when the one who dies for you becomes ever so real. It's more than your head. I know about Jesus. It's when you know he's in your heart and what he's done for you. When you realize what he's done for you, we become appreciative and we can't hold worship back. So as we look at the word this morning, we start off in prayer to ask the Lord to, okay, Lord, we know we're having supper somewhere or lunch somewhere. We know our cars, we have faith that we start our car, it's going to run and get us home. That's faith, right? Doesn't always happen that way. Some of us have broken down before, but you know what I'm talking about. So the word is for us today, and my encouragement is that you have prepared your heart to receive. Father God, we come before you, Lord, and we ask you to relieve our mind and our cares, our worries. Help us to leave them to the side. We want to give you 100% of our time right now. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak to us, that we might come to appreciate Jesus even more. We're going to see him soon. But we want to see him in the light of Scripture today as John saw him when he was taken up to heaven. Help us, Lord, to appreciate even more so that we might worship you as the universe will someday do as well. Give us ears to hear, Lord. Minds to understand. Hearts to, to beat for you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking at our passage, Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read this chapter, 14 verses. God's word says this. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or, or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, 
the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and a number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea all and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor, glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Church, you may be seated at this time. Get comfortable. If you happen to be on the edge of your seat, that's okay as well. We are to take in the word of God. It's alive. It's, it's real. And what we have is the privilege, the opportunity of being in the throne room. From chapter 4, John was taken up, right? And where does he, he doesn't see his mom, he doesn't see his dad, he doesn't see this and that. Sometimes we think, when I die and get to heaven, first reunion is with my family. Maybe, maybe not. John goes up and the first thing he sees is heaven's throne. And he is around the father, he is around the son, the elders and things like that. So who knows? But the point is, he was taken up. We are in the third section of this book entitled Revelation. And chapter 1, verse 19, broke it down. The things that are, the things, he he introduced Jesus. And then the things that are, the the seven churches at the time, that were in that church period. And things that are of the future, right? The things which take place after this. So the things that take place after this means after the church period. Believe it or not. Church came, Jesus uh, came, started the church, right? We know at Pentecost, and the church had a purpose. So they preached Jesus crucified to pay for your sins. God wants you in heaven. He desires that none perish, that all would come. So Jesus gave his life for you. It's like getting that free ticket to go to the concert, to go to the movies. uh, But better than anything, to go to heaven and live forever. The price has been paid for. That is the mission of the church to present Jesus Christ crucified, uh, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. The time of the church will end. The mission of the church will be over with before you know it. And it ends by the rapture of the church being taken up, as John is foreshadowing here, being taken up into heaven. When we are taken up into heaven... It'll be for a period of seven years. See, right now, we don't know how long the church period will be open. But we know that when we go to heaven, it's for seven years. Meanwhile, down here on earth, it's a seven-year tribulation period. And then at the end of seven years, Jesus comes back to the earth. And he, set, he, he as we say, sets up shop in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. No more sickness. No more, hey, come back. My feet hurt. My hair is all falling off. All that's over with for 1,000 years. But what happens at the end of 1,000 years? There is a uh, uh, kind of revolution that takes place. Uh, uh, Satan is freed. And, and man, for whatever reason, follows him. And Jesus has to put it out immediately. But during all this time, the 1,000 years, you and I have been serving the Lord uh, defending the kingdom, doing what we have to do. I don't mean by arms and things like that, but against speeches about, I don't know, we have to serve the Lord. I don't know if I want to go communion. And we're going to see that. And many people are going to be coming to the Lord because we will have, we'll be keen, so we'll give direction, and we'll be priests. We will inform and teach, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So we're going to be busy for those thousand years. Uh, and then, but since we're always with the Lord, when that thousand year ends, you don't have a, a, a you won't be tempted to join the other side. 
You won't sin anymore once we leave this earth, by the way. Your body that comes back for the millennium is the glorified body, will be forever with the Lord. And then eternity starts for us. So we'll get there eventually. But right now, we are in this section. So we began, so when, so we began with chapter 4 revealing heaven's open door. And John, again, our author, being taken into the throne room of God. And it was amazing. And he described these stones as, as colors of the throne, right? And he heard cries of, of holy and, and the 24 Elders around the throne, the living creatures, all worship the creator. It filled John's ears with all this. And his eyes continued to gaze and wonder at the beauty of it all being in that throne room of heaven. But then, church, all of a sudden, all of a sudden there was a situation and it completely changed that whole atmosphere of prayer, of worship, and everything else completely changed the atmosphere and John was left speechless and with that we are now ready for the rest of the scripture look at verse 1 chapter 5 and I saw in the right hand of him who saw who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. These are the words from a fellow human being, John the Apostle. Started off with Jesus as a young, the youngest apostle, the last living apostle uh, during this time, if you may, in history, right? So let's make some observations here, right? From verse 1, as the throne room of God was all of a sudden quiet, it was all quiet, John, he looked to the one sitting on the throne. And we learn from this verse that God who is sitting has a scroll in his hand. And what is different is the fact that the scrolls that John had always seen, the scrolls of that time, as we say, were private, right? Meaning the writing on the scrolls is mostly on the inside. And it's rolled up and there's a seal on it. So you don't get to open it until the person who it was written for dies. John saw the scroll. It had seven seals, but it's written on the inside and it's written on the outside. And so typically, the scroll could not be opened until the death of the person for whom it was written. Thus John waits. He waits, right? From verse 2, check this out, right? Observation. John sees a strong angel. Church, note to self. Note to self. Hollywood has deceived us. If you believe that there's always little angels on clouds, on harp, uh, some of them are very effeminate looking, and, and they're, they're just like that, right? I, I, that's not true here because the, the Bible is telling us that he saw a strong angel. Sometimes you think that angels only play harps in heaven. I've heard guys say, uh, you know, I don't want to die and just go play a harp. I didn't play one on the earth. Why, why am I going to play one in heaven? And, and they laugh it off, but really that's all they know about the other life because they get it from Hollywood. Therefore, the scripture says, eh, nope, not really, right? So our second observation is that John sees this angel as strong. Here on the earth, you and I, we see and we note who are the bodybuilders among us. And though the bodybuilder would never say to you, dude, check this out. You know, they'll never say that to us. But you and I, we see them and we say, mm, that guy, mm, he got buff, right? Glad he's my friend, Right? So I bring this up to share with you that as well as here on the earth, how we are different as human beings and shaped differently and with different uh, callings in our life, so it is in heaven. Because we learn from the book of Acts, right, that there was two angels and they're looking at the people as they're gawking, looking at Jesus being raised up. And they say, people, why are you just looking at the Lord? Don't you know that this same Jesus who is being taken up on the clouds will come back in like manner? And the Bible didn't describe them as strong. 
when Mary is at the tomb, here comes uh, the, uh, she, you know, sees the angels and says, who are you looking for? You know, and, and sometimes we get the impression they're young angels, but here they're strong. So the point is, as there are you and I, diverse people here on earth, so it is true in heaven. So don't be surprised if they're not all cookie cutter angels like we are not cookie cutter human beings. If you didn't know that, ding, you got a nugget to take home with you. Now you know there's something different, all right? All right. Third observation here is that not only does his voice, which is loud, matches his looks, right? But the angel is asking a question that invites one. He asks, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals. Now, remember, the throne room is silent all of a sudden. John is just him, just quiet, right? And, and this guy has his voice to match it. Uh, and that's a, a big plus. Why is that a big plus? Because not all strong men today have a strong voice. I think I shared with you before, my brother in, in L.A. was at a market, and uh, he was like the third person in line. And in front of him, was a big guy. You can tell, you know, it's just a big guy. He had a tank top and whatnot. So you could see his guns, as we say, his arms and whatnot. And uh, his back is to my, my brother. My brother's in line. And the people are behind, lining up behind my brother. And this guy in front of him, this big guy, is waiting on someone in front of him. So the people in the back say, oh, my gosh, you know, these people, always, why don't they pay with their coupons or have their coupons ready? And have you ever felt the pressure, you know, and why don't they have their check? Why are they writing checks? Slide the card. You're taking too long writing checks. And so sometimes you feel the pressure. My brother's saying, you could feel the pressure. I could feel the pressure. People are saying this, and I'm trying to be nice to the people behind me. Like, I ain't telling this big guy whatever, right? And all of a sudden, my brother says, the big guy turned around. And my brother thought he was done. This guy's going to eat him up. But the big, strong guy says, I don't know why you're rushing me. It's not my fault. It's the people in front of us. You all need to learn to be patient. And he turned around. Well, the people all have their jaws dropped, you know, because the voice did not match the frame that's in front of them. And that's our world today. But here, no mistake. The, the strong angel had a voice, and that voice is saying, who, who is worthy to open up this scroll that has a future, that has everything going on in it? It's God's plan for the earth. Who is worthy? And that's what we have here. And so John, again, he waited and waited and waited. And from verse 3, again, observe that the invitation went out to heaven to earth and a place unknown to us, but outside of man's uh, bag of marbles for understanding, there is a place that could have responded to the angel's invitation, known simply as under the earth, right? Heaven, earth, and under the earth. Oh, it's real. It's as real as heaven and earth is, but no one from there, from under the earth, no one responded, right? Church, all three places, heaven, earth, and under the earth, have been created by God. We know that heaven is God's throne room. We know that the earth is his footstool. And under the earth, uh, perhaps, may just be his place of eternal punishment. I remember as a kid, they used to tell us, you're going up to heaven or you're going down to hell. And so a lot of us always thought that what's down there is hell. And we learned that the core of the earth later on is really hot. And the Christian kids would be saying, huh? and the Catholic kids all would be saying, huh? it's hell. It must be hell, right? Could be. I don't know, right? But it's possible that they could have answered, but they didn't answer. Now, you may question the possibility of an answer coming from heaven. You probably won't question of a possibility of an answer stepping out from heaven and says, I'm worthy of opening the scroll. We might be open to that. You might be open to someone on the earth. You, I mean, in, in other words, your mind computes that someone from the earth could say, I'm open to that. Or, I mean, I can probably open it. So we kind of think that. But from under the earth, we're saying, nah, who from under the earth? We're not 100% sure if an answer could come from under the earth. But if from under the earth does relate to the place of eternal punishment, then the gospel of Luke, Dr. Luke wrote in chapter 16, verse 19 through 31, he recorded Jesus' parable of the rich man 
and Lazarus. And both of them died. And while they're gone from the earth, it's the rich man that begins a conversation. And he says, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, can you have Lazarus dip his finger in water and bring it over to me and put it at least on my tongue because I'm thirsty? So a couple of things are going on as you're reading this is that on the other side of, be it hell or whatever, right? They can see, they can touch, and he's speaking Father Abraham, so he could have, someone could have answered from there is my point, but it didn't. And you could read that, of course, in Luke chapter 16. But that's what was going on. It's the, it's the rich man who is being tormented that carries on the conversation. Just thought you should know that. From verse 4, we make another observation, and that is this. We find John still waiting, and I'm sure that everyone in all three places have become curious what in the world is in that scroll. What does the scroll say, right? What are its contents? But after John realizes, and that's when you finally, it sinks in, no one is worthy to, of opening and reading and just even looking at the scroll, after he realized it, the Bible says he wept much. Did you know that? Did you notice that? Now think about it, church. God had plans, and who knows what else was written on the scroll, and it has to all come to a halt, stop. We're at the end because no one's name is on a worthy roster. No one's name was on a worthy roster. John himself didn't make, to the, make it to the worthy roster. Moses and the prophets are not there on the worthy roster, right? None of the disciples made it. And guess what? You and I didn't cut the mustard also. We're not on that worthy roster. We then, like John, should be weeping. We are unworthy. If it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, where would we be? So we should be weeping as well. Church, perhaps John is also weeping because if no one made the worthy roster, the vision, perhaps like one of yours, one of yours or my greatest dreams, that we're saying, oh, this dream is so good. I can't be dreaming. I don't think I'm dreaming. And then we wake up. Oh, man, we're back on earth. You know, maybe for John, he says, if no one opens up the scroll, then i got to return back to earth. This vision or this, this visitation of the throne room of heaven is over with. Maybe that's why he's weeping. But check out verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, and it says, behold is kind of like pointing somewhere. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Church, talk about an instant mood change for, for John. He was weeping much, and all of a sudden, stop weeping, dude, stop your crying. Check this out. Check who is worthy, right? So, indeed, these titles, these titles were familiar to John. So as he's hearing this Lion of Judah, this, this Root of David, indeed, John recognized him. He grew up with these titles. He knew that they belonged to the Messiah. So John is following that head now once he said, Behold, and if he's going like this, John's kind of following the, the, you know, the, the soldier's head you know, to find out where he's at. And so he's saying to him, Behold, for this man has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. So church, John, John, he was anticipating. Once he heard that, he heard the titles. Man, Root of Jesse, Lion Joe. He's anticipating seeing his friend, Jesus. He's anticipating seeing the Lord, Jesus, right? His Savior. But his eyes were shocked at what he saw. He was shocked at what he saw. Verse 6, look. And I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. John Church was surprised. He was totally surprised. All of us, all of us remember in Easter time especially, we have the the triumphal entry and the Jews 
are all around Jesus saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, they expected uh, Jesus to become their warrior king. That's what they expected. Well, guess what? John thought that Jesus would be dressed up as a king, as a king as well, right? But instead, he saw the sacrificial lamb. Now think about this. A lamb, as we see out here on Ogden Road, if you're ever coming through or throughout Montrose, right? A lamb is one of the most helpless, perhaps one of the most gentlest of creatures. In season, it provides wool for uh, use, for our use, right? And then the season changes and uh, they become prepared for slaughter. And likewise, Jesus came to earth and made himself of no reputation. He didn't come over to the earth and start walking like some of the hoodlums. From heaven, where are you from? Right? None of that from Jesus. He made himself a man of no reputation. He wasn't hanging on. I got ribbons, dude. I took first place in heaven. None of this stuff, right? He made himself a man, a, a, hum, a humble man, right? He took the role of a bondservant. He came in the likeness of man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. As a lamb's flesh, it provides for physical life. Jesus' flesh, his body provided for eternal life. The apostle John would have recognized Jesus in this role. He had been the, his savior on the cross, right? John saw him on the cross. John saw him torn. He saw him battered, bloody, right? Thus, when Jesus entered the throne room, he entered as the redemptive, redemptive sacrifice. Church, the slain lamb was a reminder to everyone of the justice of what is about to take place on the earth. He's a reminder. You see, Jesus had suffered and died on the cross so that every person who was about to experience the coming wrath of God would have an opportunity for redemption. Redemption means saved out of. Redemption means, you know, like an old car, right? If you gave me an old 64 Chevy Impala, I know how to redeem this car and make it like a brand new lowrider, right? I can do these kind of things. You and I as human beings, the Lord has redeemed us from the darkness and the sinful ways and the crooked ways that we were in. And he's redeemed us so that we can go to heaven. It's on him, on Jesus, this slain lamb that, that John is looking at. And he is standing there in the throne. And he's looking around. And there's angels. And there's, there's creatures. And there's 24 elders. And, and, and godly people. Why am I looking at a slain lamb next to God? Getting ready to take the roll. The scroll. Because if it wasn't for him, nobody would be there. They wouldn't be there. You and I would not be going to heaven if it wasn't for this slain lamb. And sometimes we're so callous. Sometimes we, you know, yeah, I know Jesus. I know him up here. I, I think I've invited him here. But again, it's like when someone, if you have a buddy that took a bullet for you, and died in your place, and you came to be part of that service, man, your heart would be bleeding, and you, there's nothing you wouldn't do for that family. And some of us don't see Jesus that way, and especially like on Memorial Day weekend like right now. He has taken our place. Every day is a Memorial Day. We should be remembering what he did for us so that we could come and be in heaven forever and ever. So Jesus had to suffer and die on the cross so that every person who was about to experience the coming wrath would have an opportunity for redemption. But history shows that they rejected that free gift, free gift, but it got, cost Jesus so much. It cost him his life. They have turned their backs on God's gift and mercy. And now, whatever they're about to face during the tribulation, 
whatever they're about to face as he opens the scrolls, it would be, be based on their choice, on their own choice to reject Jesus. Thus, church, the lamb was standing at the throne surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. Uh, there were some unusual aspects. We noted some properties to the lamb, right? That is seven horns, which represent his complete power, right? Seven for completion. It's a number. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God or the Holy Spirit, whom we have spoken about earlier. When I say that to you, whom we have spoken of earlier, I make a reference to a little time before. Understand you could go on our webpage, Calvary Chapel webpage, and pull up chapter 4, chapter 3, chapter 2, chapter 1, and come up to date just that quickly. You could do it in one afternoon, right? So we get to verse 7. Then, look at your Bible, he came and he and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Church, the place erupted. Remember silence? John waiting? Angel saying, who is worthy to take the scroll? No one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth. And here it's quiet and all of a sudden the slain lamb comes up to the one seated on the throne, God the Father, and he takes the scroll. The place erupted. John saw Jesus, the Son, who has the Holy Spirit resting on him, receiving the scroll from the hand of the Father. Verse 8, look at your Bible. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Church, something about our world and worldly ways, uh, they have a gesture called drop the mic, right? And uh, according to Wikipedia, a mic drop is the gesture of intentionally dropping one's microphone at the end of a performance or speech to signal triumph. Figuratively, it is an expression of triumph for a successful event and indicates a boastful attitude toward the one's own performance. Well, I got news for you. Jesus didn't drop a mic when he took the scroll. I, I guess he could have. He could have taken it and then, you know, he didn't do that. He didn't do any of that, right? When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they dropped like mics, right? We also learn from this verse that the creatures and elders uh, had harps and golden bowls full of incense. And we are told that these are the prayers of the saints. Church, a couple observations here. Number one, the obvious one, yes, there are harps in heaven, but I didn't say there weren't any. I just said the angels aren't plucking them all the time, right? But there are harps in heaven, and these uh, elders are using them, right? Second observation here is prayers are as incense, a well-pleasing aroma to God. But here's the question. Are you ready for the question? Can you answer this question? Who are these saints here in verse 8 whose prayers are as incense before God? Hmm. Some say... And I myself have taught this, that the prayers are of the saints who appear in chapter 7 who have been martyred, have been martyred by Antichrist. However, the seals of the scroll have not yet been opened, right? It is possible that persecution against the saints has already begun by the time we're in heaven or John is in heaven looking at this. Or... Could it be that they are your prayers and my prayers and the prayers of the 2,000 years past since Jesus taught us in Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe these are the prayers that it's about to happen. Jesus is about to open the scroll. So the angels have or the elders have these bowls, golden bowls of these prayers going up. So, church, it makes sense that the prayers are calling for God to put his plans into motion. And they're about to happen, especially now that Jesus has the scroll in his hand. 
they could be our prayers. You might be even praying today or when you heard this in Texas, man, come, Lord Jesus, come. And if prayers are like incense, they're being offered before the Lord. Let me say something about saints here because sometimes we, we get a little goofy with this. Uh, are the prayers of the saints. Sometimes you per, if you weren't brought up in church uh, where they teach the Bible, you don't know that once a person turns their life over to Jesus, asks Jesus to forgive them of their sins, accepts him in their heart as his, their personal Lord and Savior, the Bible calls you a saint. Today, you're either a saint or an ain't. There's no other place. You're either a saint or an ain't. If you're a saint, that means you have asked Jesus to come into your heart. And, and listen, you don't have to do saintly things. What happens is God sees you. He sees you, if you may, through the lens of his son. That's how he sees you. He sees his son, his sacrifice, and then you're behind that. That's how he sees you. And so he calls you a saint. You will live forever because of Jesus. You can't do enough good on your own. So Jesus came to do it for you. Why else would he have come? If there was any other way, I'm sure heaven would say, take the left road, take the right road, take this one, choose door number three to help you to get to heaven. But there is no other way, and we fall short. No one is worthy. We didn't make the worthy list. Thus God sent Jesus. So we are saints if we come through him. So again, we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. So now, as the creatures and elders offer the bowls of the incense before God, they begin now to pluck their harps strings, if you may. And look at verse 9. Look at your Bible. And they sang a new song. Can we just stop here? Most of you don't like new songs. Amen? Most of you would rather be singing, bringing in the sheaves. Written by, you know, the Fanny Crosbys of our world. Most of you don't want to hear a new song. You get tired when Sarah introduces a new song, right? What are you going to do up here? This is heaven, by the way. We're in heaven. Are you seeing this? And they sang a new song. Does that eliminate you? Because you don't want to learn a new song? Are you going to be on the sidelines? I wish they'd sing Fanny Crasby music. Is that you? Listen. You're going to be changed, thank God. Aren't you glad? If you can't learn a new song right now, could it be because of stubbornness? If so, is it time to ask the Lord, Lord, can you take your spiritual scalpel, come down to my heart, and cut out this little hard area that I get so turned off by new songs? Scripture says, and they sang a new song. Someone's doing it. Could you imagine if there had not been another song since Bringing in the Sheaves? We have reached the climax of new songs. You guys in the 1800s, too bad. You have to learn what we sang in the 1900s, 1920s, right? But now there are no more new songs. Could you imagine if there was no more new songs? You see, it's us. It's, uh, it's us who are finite beings. We come to an end because we don't allow ourselves to continue to grow. We get comfortable in plateauing. And I'm telling you, plateau is not a good thing. When I'm in the hospital rooms and we're praying for a loved one and that heart machine plateaus, they're dead. Right now, you can choose to either spiritually keep living, asking God to grow you in these areas, or you can die right there. And you won't be singing that new song. This is incredible, right? So let's keep on. Look at your Bible. It's there. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. I don't know. Maybe our musicians ought to put that into music. There's a challenge for you, worship team. Put that into music. It's a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open. I don't know how it's going to go, but, you know, it's a song. Anyway, let's read the lyrics. You were, and, and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. There it is again. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. 
and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Church, the four living creatures and the 24 elders have begun to sing while they have fallen before the Lamb, and they realize what has taken place. So history, what has, what took place yesterday? What has taken place? That is, that they have been redeemed to God by the blood of the Lamb, who is standing right there in front of them, right? They're singing the song. By the blood of the Lamb, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So they're not Jews. That's only one tribe, one nation. They certainly aren't angels. They can't be redeemed. Who are they? Who are they? Who's been redeemed out of every nation? How about you and me? Raise your hand if you have a German background this morning. Oh, different, right? Raise your hand if you come from East Los Angeles, also known as the armpit of the world. You know, no, just kidding. Raise your hand if you're from Ireland or have an Irish background, right? There you go. You know, listen, listen to what it's saying. You know, they have been, they have been redeemed to God by the blood of the Lamb out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And they also, so this is what they realize. We're all here in, from all over the place because of Jesus. And they also realize what will surely take place, and that is that Jesus will make them kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Let me ask you something, church. And it's a, by the way, let me ask you this. Who is the only group of people who can say out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, right? We have been redeemed. Who is the only group of people? It's the church. It's only the church that can say this, right? It's only the church, which means that the church is in heaven here in chapter 5 before the tribulation starts in chapter 6. You know, when you start putting this together, oh, my word, it's true. Here it is, right? So we start seeing that. You're not going to the tribulation period. I'm not going to the tribulation period. Father God's not going to beat us up and then present us to his son with black eyes. Here's your church, son. He's not going to do that, right? Not happening. Also, church, regarding us being kings and priests, I have this ongoing little dialogue with my daughter, Andrea, who says to me, Dad, I don't know about kings, Dad. Do you think literally kings sometimes? And, you know, some of us don't have the temperament to be kings. We don't want to be kings. And, and uh, Andrea, it doesn't matter what you want, honey. You're going to be in heaven. The Lord's doing this for us. He has a plan, and his plan, I know how your plan is. It's about this big, huh? His plan is like from Walmart to the airport, big. I mean, it's big plan for you. He's going to change you. He's not leaving you as he found you. Thank God. He's changing us all the time. And these seven years with him just hanging out, glory, hallelujah, our Pentecostal friends would say. Right? This is a great thing that's going to happen out here. So kings, you should know, and I think you could swallow this and be a little bit easier with this. Kings have a responsibility of providing leadership for people. So just providing leadership. I know how some of you ladies are. You provide leadership. Don't eat those potatoes. They're very hot. Blow on them a little bit. That's providing leadership. Honey, drink all your milk. Best if the cow isn't with us anymore. So you provide, right? But you'll be able to provide later on. You just, we see you guys at the bus stops, you know, at the school stop. Uh, sir, you cannot come in with your car this way. Turn it around the other way. And, man, you're out there. I mean, don't, don't come in this way. And so parents learn how to go the right way and drop off their kids. Don't say you can't provide direction. Yes, you can or instruction. And so the Lord's going to use that raw talents that we have and perfect them, right? It's going to be an amazing time. The Lord promises that they will share his throne, Revelation 3.21. This will happen after the tribulation when Jesus returns to the earth and establishes his kingdom, according to Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Now, during Jesus' reign on earth, corrupt governments, evil dictators will not be allowed to continue. King Jesus will use his redeemed, right, people, right, uh, uh, to rule over the nations. He's going to have us be on guard for the things that Jesus esteems. So we're going to be able to do that. The redeemed, we, the redeemed are also priests. And as such, 
we will have responsibility to direct people to God. Also to teach the word of God. To counsel and to pray for others. That's part of our priestly responsibilities in heaven. You forget or you do not know that when we come back to earth, we, the earth has never experienced a population boom as will happen when Jesus sets his foot on the earth. First of all, you don't die anymore at 70, 80, 90, 100 years, right? You live for a thousand years, right? The people who come into the tribulation, uh, after the tribulation, into the kingdom, and we're not talking about you and me, the people that come in, the survivors that come in from the countries around them, the Bible talks about them, right? They'll marry, they'll have children, there will be no more cancer, there will be no more diabetes, there will be no more fatitis like Ben. You know, not, all these things are gone. They're going to live for a thousand years. So in that, it's a huge population. The soils, the waters, and everything, the Lord is going to make all brand new. It's going to be a fantastic time. And I better hurry because I'm running out of time. So anyway, plenty of things to do. So we'll be able to do these things. 11, look at your Bible. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 was 10, times 10,000 and a thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Again, he's in the middle. He's, he's the whole thing. To receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Church, what started off as worship around the throne when Jesus took the scroll has continued to grow and grow and grow. And listen, true worship takes place when those in heaven saw the slain lamb. That's when it happened. And it's true that when a congregation such as us, as we are here today, begin to understand that Jesus really, really, really died for you. And he's there pictured as he was. He died for you. That's when we, when we realize this, that's when true worship really begins. It really begins. In fact, anyone who truly sees the slain lamb cannot help but worship and begin the thank yous, the thank yous, the thank yous, and I worship you. 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. So church, worthy is the Lamb. We are beginning to understand this, but here in verse 13, we learn of those who already understand his worth. These creatures do. Those in heaven and earth and under the earth, such are in the sea and all that are in them. So the question always is, will your pet make it to heaven? Will your pet make it to heaven? Well, I don't know for sure, but Jesus does come back to earth riding on a, on a horse. Revelation 19, on a horse, right? Hmm. 14, then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. The worship service climax with the entire universe praising the Lamb and, of God and the Father seated on the throne. Interesting is the fact that the four living creatures said amen. And as we learned in chapter 3, verse 14, right, that Jesus is the amen. He is the amen. So it's likely they are praising the Lord loudly, saying, Jesus, or the amen, has the, the scroll. Again, we as followers end our prayers by saying amen. Here the four living creatures are saying amen as Jesus has the scroll, the title T to the earth, and something Big is about to happen as Jesus is about to take the first seal off the scroll and open it. But you'll have to come back next week for that as we continue with the rest of the scripture. Father God, you're so good to us to give us peekaboo of what's happening in heaven. And we are so lame that we just can't put our arms around you as the slain lamb. That's what provoked the worship. You're the only one worthy. <laughs> Lord, help us to embrace you. Help us to worship you. Help us to appreciate you. Help us to grow in you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that has not yet been redeemed, meaning they haven't given 
or surrendered their life completely to you, have not asked you when they're with their own lips, confessed you as their Lord and God to come into their heart. May that happen today, Lord. For the rest of us, Lord, keep us patient to the rapture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.